Welcome to The Simple Truth. Uh, we've been looking at the Gospel of John, and I, I hope you've got your Bibles out and that you're following along with me, uh, taking some notes, because I think it's very important for you to take notes and then go back <clears throat> and uh, take time to, to review them, but also to, to know that they are uh, something that you can accept. Uh, and not that I would ever try to tell you a lie, but, but that uh, I may misstate something, and, and I'm only human. I make mistakes. I'm not perfect yet, though God already sees me as perfect, and He does you too. But we're still in this flesh, and sometimes the words don't come out as it means. And I also realize that sometimes uh, another person can say the, almost the same thing that I did, and yet make it clearer to you. So I'm, I'm not afraid of, of you, you know, studying it yourself. Uh, I encourage you to do that. Now, we've been talking about in chapter 3, where they was talking to John about, well, Jesus is on the other side of the Jordan and he's baptizing people, which he, he wasn't, the disciples were. And there's more people coming to him than you. You know, and he's kind of like, <clears throat> and, and so he's reminding them that you standing there in verse 28, you standing there, you heard me say, I am not the Christ. I'm the one that God sent before him to prepare the way. Uh, so he's, he's again telling them. But then in verse 29, he talks more about his position of who he is and how thankful he is where he's at. <clears throat> verse 29, uh, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bride who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, his joy of mine, uh, therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. So here he's saying, OK, I'm not what we call the groom today. They call the bridegroom. I'm just the one who, uh, at that time, the custom was that they would be someone who would negotiate <coughs> the marriage in a way so that, you know, his parents and her parents would agree. And then he, he would take care of, of making sure that all the, the feisty and, and everything was together. But then he would stand outside of the door to hear that the bride and the groom was, was speaking um, wonderful words to each other. And that's when he could walk away and say, it has been a good match, okay? And so here he's saying, I'm, I'm just a friend of the, bride, of, the, of the groom, and I rejoice because I... I've had the privilege, the honor of being in this position. And what he's saying is God called me to this position and it's an honor for me to be here to do this. And, and then verse 30, he makes a very, very good point that we all should remember. Uh, he must increase, but I must decrease. Here's a, a plain truth that John the Baptist was bringing to us. That is not about John the Baptist. It's not about me. It's not about pastor. It is about Jesus. I must decrease to promote Jesus more. Okay. I'm not looking. Uh, what John is saying is I'm not looking for um, a great follower of people to me. I want you to look to Jesus. He's the one who we should be following. Uh, verse 31, And he who comes from above is above all, and he who is on the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Notice he's putting the point here. Those things that are on the earth, they're not as high or in a high, as high a level as those things in heaven. That is a higher plane, you might say, and more authority than what earth has. Uh, and he's talking about Jesus, of course, of coming from heaven. So he has more authority than, than the earth. 
a man of earth, okay? Uh, John is talking about himself even here. Uh, Jesus has more authority because he came from heaven. Uh, but I am earthly and I can only do what is allowed for me to do. Verse 32, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. Notice that what he's talking about is the things that Jesus said. If it's not received, you know, Jesus is testified of what he has seen and what he's heard. And then he who receives his testimony, in other words, you or me, uh, has certified that God is true, that God has given us the truth and we can testify that it's not of man, but that is of God. Verse 34, for he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for God has not given the spirit by measure. Now notice this, he's talking about Christ again. Uh, the he there is, is for he whom God sent. Jesus is the one that God sent to bring salvation to the world. And he didn't give Jesus just a measure of the Holy Spirit. He gave him the full, full measure of fullness. Um, he's talking about the complete. Jesus had all giftings of all types. Okay. Uh, he had them had it all because of the fullness of the Holy Spirit that was in him. Uh, verse 35, the father loves the son and has given all things to his hands. Notice it is, it is progressive here. It's going forward. Uh, verse 36, and he who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So here he's making that another point again about the gospel that those that believe in, in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, has everlasting life. Now, that doesn't mean that, that you give just lip service. That means that you are giving yourself to follow after Christ, that you are applying the Word of God to your own life, and that you are exhibiting Christ-like features in His personality we're talking about in your own life. But he says that those that do not accept Christ, God's wrath will abide on him. In other words, the deeds that are not under the blood, that have not been forgiven, they're still there. And God's wrath will one day bring judgment on you who do it. Okay? And it's not because God doesn't love you. It is because you would not accept his love. Okay, chapter four. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples did. Remember, I've been telling you, Jesus was not the one doing the baptism. It was his disciples. And John's making that point. John, the, the apostle John, is putting that little... Uh, paraphrased in there, uh, Jesus was not doing the baptizing the disciples were. Verse 3, He left Judah and departed again to Galilee, but He needed to go through Samaria. Now, now you want to remember that the, the dealings between the Jews and the Samaritans were not, they didn't do it. Okay? Uh, the, the Jews thought they were the pure race and that the Samaritan was a mixed race even though they were part Jews and part Gentile, uh, is, is the belief system that was there, uh, because they, they'd stopped following God. But then when they wanted to follow God and, and to uh, follow all the commandments that God had set down, all the laws that had set down, uh, the Jews didn't accept it. There was a good opportunity for, for forgiveness to be seen and, and exhibited, but it didn't happen. Uh, but notice it said it was needed to go through Samaria. In other words, here was a here was a divine guidance that it was necessary to go to a divine appointment that Jesus needed to make. 
Okay? Verse 5, so he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sidar, uh, near the plot of ground that Jake gave to his son Joseph. Now Joseph well was there, and Jesus therefore, being weary from his journey, sat down uh, thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour or about noon. This was about noon. The sixth hour is about what we would call, you know, 12 o'clock noon. Uh, notice that he, he gets weary when he travels. Uh, he was a physical man also, but he was all God too. But he, he had those, those um, he got tired the same as you and I do. Now verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciple has gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Notice her first question was, was when Jesus said, Give me a drink, he wasn't putting her down. He was simply asking uh, for a drink. And she immediately said, why are you talking to me for? There's two things going on here. First of all, the Jews did not talk to the Samaritans. They didn't have dealings with them. And the other thing, here is Jesus, a Jew, talking to a woman. That was not, a, that was not appropriate at the time either. That was the custom. Uh, you can talk to your wife out in, in public, but you couldn't talk by yourself to another woman. It was not kosher. It was not a thing that you did. It was against the custom. Okay, so she's asking these two questions of him. And then Jesus in verse 10 answers and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who would have said to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Notice that Jesus is bringing the spiritual side of this, this equation. Um, you know, if you would have, uh, this is the spirit side. Uh, and the woman then, verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as the sons and his livestock? So, so she's, she's still thinking, and we'll get into the more of this the story a little bit later, but she's still thinking in the present. She's still thinking, you know, hey, you don't have anything to draw water with. So what makes you think, you know, and our well's deep. You can't just reach into it and get a drink. It's deep. You, the water level is, is way below the ground surface. And so then in verse 13, Jesus said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Uh, talking about the nature side of it. We drink water, we get thirsty again. But verse 14, but whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, what's he talking about? The water that he's talking about that was spring up in it like a fountain of youth. Uh, it, is, it is that everlasting life. It is the word of God that washes us on the inside. And as we teach and as we speak the words of God, it is bubbling up out of us as a spring would do in the natural. So he's bringing the two elements together to help her to, to understand the spirit side of what he's saying. Um, verse 15, the woman said, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Uh, so uh, when she asked this question, we need, to, we need to understand why she was at the well about noon. Uh, she was saying, you know, give me this water so I not, not only that I don't have to, to drink anymore, that I won't ever get thirsty again, but I won't ever have to come to this well about noon when everyone else, the more likely that everyone else is home eating their dinner, their lunch, as we say, they're having a meal and not at the well because of her living style. She did not want to be among other people because they would have uh, spoken um, uh, degradingly of her because of her 
situation. Okay, so she was looking for two things here. I don't want to ever get drunk, get, get thirsty again, but I won't have to come out into public to get water. And then Jesus in verse 16 says, go call your husband to come here. So he gives her a command. Go tell your husband to come here. I want to talk to him too. Verse 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. It is in that you spoke truly. So now we know why she was coming to the well about noon when there wasn't anybody else around because of the living with a, with a man that, that was not her husband and that her whole life had been one of, of, of husband to husband to husband. Now, we don't know whether the husbands, those five husbands died or whether they was divorced or what, but, but evidently she had been married several times. And then in verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Notice that now that Jesus had told her about her, and I want you to understand that, that what Jesus was doing was using another gift of the Holy Spirit, and that is the word of knowledge. He could not have known, being a Jew and not having anything to do with the Samaritans, he could not have known this woman's situation unless the Spirit had told him. So it was a word of knowledge. It's not telling the whole thing, but he's telling enough, just a word of it, to know and to make her perceive that he's a prophet. Verse 22, our fathers worked in this, worshiped in this mountain and you Jews says it is that Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So notice now that she thinks he's a prophet, that she's, she has been <clears throat> this witness of, of Jesus telling her about her five husbands and the one she's with isn't her husband she perceives that he's a prophet, but through this uh, word of knowledge, he's witness to her. It has drawn her into to more deeper asking questions than that was, are we supposed to worship here? Or are we supposed to worship in Jerusalem? In verse 21, Jesus gives the answer. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. So, so he's presenting to her a difference. It's not Jerusalem. It's not here on this mountain that you worship the Father. But the, here's the way you put, it's going to be. Uh, verse 22, you worship what you do not know, and we know what we worship for salvation of the Jews. He's not putting her down. He's saying we worship God because of the law and the knowing of God that it was brought through the Jews. But you're not, should I say, privy to all of the information that we have. But he's not putting her down. He's simply helping her to understand. Verse 23, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So here he's saying it is no longer, there's a time coming and, and it's soon and now is that you don't worship the Father by doing the ritual um, things that you've been doing as the sacrifice uh, of a bull or a uh, ram or, or a lamb or whatever. Uh, those things are not going to be what worships God, but it is going to be the true worship of loving the Father through Jesus and worshiping in a spiritual sense and not in a physical sense. All of the Old Testament uh, rituals were physical things to do, okay? Where now 
It is a spiritual. We worship God in prayer. We worship God by giving him the glory for the things that 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 is done through us by his willingness to work through us, by his love for us, by his his sending his son to die for us, to shed his blood for the redemption of mankind. And then we have a choice of either accepting that or rejecting it. But we have to worship the God in, in spirit. It's no longer uh, I'll be accepted if I do this. But from the heart, Lord, I do this because of you. OK, verse 25. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. Who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And notice she's saying she's trying to bring out that she's not ignorant of things of God. Because she says, we know, I know the Messiah is coming. And that he's called Christ, the anointed. But also he will tell us everything we need to know. He will teach us all. In verse 26, Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, this is one of the one time that that Jesus actually comes out and makes it very plain. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah that you're looking for, that you know is coming. I'm him. And that's what Jesus is saying to her. Now, verse 27, at this point, the disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you talk to her? In other words, they kept their mouth shut. They wondered, but they didn't say anything. Verse 28, and the woman then left her water pots, went, went her way into the city and said to the men, notice she left her water pots. I mean, that's why she went to the well in the first place was to get water. But she left them at the well. Um, verse 28, uh, the woman then left her water pots, went away into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. And in the meantime, the disciples urged him saying, Robana or teacher, eat. Rabbi. But he said to them, I have food to eat which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said one to another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? And you notice that the disciples sometimes, and we're just the same, is haven't got a clue of what Jesus is talking about. They're thinking, well, somebody must have brought him food already. And, and Jesus is talking about spirit things. When he's talking about, I have food to eat which is not known, he is talking about the spiritual satisfaction of doing God's work that has been given him to do. But it also the satisfaction of knowing that it's being successful. Jesus, in verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In other words, I'm doing his work. That's the food I'm eating. It is a spiritual food. It is one of satisfaction that you get as if you ate a meal, but it is of the spiritual nature. Verse 35. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have uh, entered into their labor. So Jesus is saying, I, I'm looking at a harvest of souls, not of grain, but of souls that is being reaped here. Notice, and I, and I want to bring this out to you. <clears throat> Notice that he plant the seed into the woman. Okay. One seed. 
the woman being, you know, his word is the seed, but, but he planted into one fertile ground, and that was the woman in this case. She goes and tells the people in the city, and they come out to see Jesus. Okay? They want to find out for themselves what happened. And then we find that the sower and the reaper are both rewarded because they've worked together as a team. Uh, where we sow, one sows that someone else may reap, but again, where someone else sows, we could reap. Uh, and that's the idea behind this. Uh, and then verse 39, and many of the Samaritans that lived uh, that, of that city believed in him because of the words the woman had who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans come to him, he, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his own words. Uh, verse 42, then he said to the woman, they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, as we think about this in closing, notice they didn't believe because she witnessed of him knowing all about her. They believed when they had that personal relationship with him. It is one thing for you to hear me encourage you to know Christ. But until you meet him, that's when salvation comes. When you can say for yourself, I met Jesus and I know that he's true and I believe on him and on him alone. It is then we are, we can say the same as, we, as I've said of the gifts of the spirit and all the gifts that, that God gives us. They are witnessing tools and you and I should be a witness to testify of what Christ has done in our lives so that others can meet Jesus and know Jesus for themselves. Once again, it's not to bring people to me or to any other man, but to Jesus. We are the candlestick that holds up the light. And Jesus is the light of the world. And it's him that I encourage you to follow after. And if you're a believer, Read his word and follow him closer and be more like him. If you're a non-believer, it's a good day to be a believer. Salvation is today and it's for you. God loves you that much. God bless you all. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.